Welcome to This Lawyer's Life, a podcast of the New York City Bar Association. Your host, Gregory Benstock, is the City Bar's Director of Professional Development. Today, he sits down with Tracy Salmon-Smith, a partner at Fagry Drinker. Tracy's 30-year career has taken her through big law, in-house practice, and service as an assistant U.S. attorney. She took us on a deep dive of her experience mentoring lawyers and cultivating mentors of her own. You sort of have like a board of directors of mentors and sponsors, and, and people have different roles on that board. Tracy also shares a clear-eyed outlook on how young lawyers can cultivate their own success on the way to the top. A lot of times it is a mindset and they do think that they cannot do it because they think there's some magic to it, but there's no magic to it. It's all about relationships. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the city bar. Here's Gregory Benstock. Welcome everyone to This Lawyer's Life. I'm Gregory Binstock, Director of Professional Development here at the New York City Bar Association, and we're thrilled to kick off this podcast where we talk with lawyers about seizing opportunities, learning lessons the hard way, and about what makes them tick. Tracy Salmon-Smith, you're a leader in the profession, you're chair of the Labor Employment Law Committee here at the City Bar and deeply involved in numerous other bar associations. You're a former assistant U.S. attorney, former in-house counsel, You've been named to the National Black Lawyers Top 100. You're a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, and now you're a partner at Fagri Drinker. Welcome, Tracy. We're so glad to have you join us here. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Let's jump right in. Something we like to say around here is that behind every great lawyer, there are three more great lawyers. And a lot of seasoned legal professionals would say that relationships build the lawyer. So what are the relationships that you've built your career on? So early in my career, I had three great mentors while I was an associate at Rifkin, Rattler, and Kremer on Long Island. So I worked with Bill Savino, Joe Ortego, and Michael Marsh. And I feel that mentors are essential because they really help to shape and influence your career. And as someone you can look up to as a role model. So I had started as a summer associate at Rifkin and as many summer associates and junior lawyers, I don't know anything about practicing law. So I went through my first year, my first summer associate. I then joined the firm as a first year associate and worked with Bill Savino in the insurance coverage and commercial litigation practice group. And Bill was the head of that group. And he was always so gracious with his time and his energy. He really made me feel like I could be a great lawyer. He took the time to to teach me and he always had some inspiring words. There would be times I would sit in his office and just watch. So I was sitting there waiting for his attention on a project that I was doing with him. And while I was sitting there, I would see how he handled clients on the phone, associates or partners who came into his office, and importantly, how he handled his staff. And so sidebar secret, when one is starting out in a law firm, I think you should listen to the legal assistants because they know a lot of what has gone on and what will be going on and how to help you. Bill, while I would be sitting there, he would show me the ropes by his words and his actions. And for me, being a woman of color, that was phenomenal. I just learned so much from him. While I was at Rifkin, I also had the opportunity to work with Joe Ortego, and he's currently a partner at Nixon Peabody, and we've maintained a relationship all these years. So Joe took an interest in my career from early on. Because of Joe, I was able to get into the courtroom early. He had me working and appearing on cases on behalf of the RTC following the savings and loans crisis. And he was a former prosecutor, so he knew how important it was for me to get into the courtroom. So I appeared in court from the city court in Long Beach to the courts in the state in Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, Suffolk. And I also appeared in the Eastern District. Wherever I was willing to go, he was willing to send me. And it was a great situation because it helped me to learn a lot. And then also being in court gave me the opportunity to observe how other attorneys behaved in court as well. So both Bill and Joe were partners and my other mentor was Michael Marsh and he was an associate. He was actually only a year ahead of me. He's currently a partner at the Ackerman firm. But we always used to joke that we mentored each other when we were coming up through Rifkin. The firm was an open atmosphere where we could learn from each other. And as associates, we worked hard, we worked late, no question was too crazy. And I think the important lesson that I learned at that time is that your peers can be your mentors as well. And 
are those kind of mentorships sort of more formal in the sense of is the firm trying to match you with someone? Is it someone is a partner and you're an associate on their team or is it more informal? I would say it's more informal. And I think that those are the kinds of mentorships that sort of develop organically that are best. There's definitely a place for sort of matching people to be mentor and mentee. But I think you have to really think about the people involved and not just match to match sake. You've mentioned that you're a woman of color. I'm gathering from the misters that you've mentioned that these are not women of color. Are there distinct benefits to matching new attorneys with mentors with common experiences and perspectives? Does it seem like firms prioritize that? Or is the expectation that some of the more powerful white men should be mentoring folks of all different experiences and perspectives? So I do think that anyone can be your mentor and they don't have to look like you have the same kinds of experiences that you do. But it is important that you do have people like that in your corner. So one of the things that I like to tell people is that you sort of have like a board of directors of mentors and sponsors and people have different roles on that board. And so there may be situations where you have powerful people who are helping to mentor you or who are sponsoring you who may not look like you. And then in other situations, you have people that more closely resemble you and your background. And those people have a place as well in in sort of your board of directors of your career. I love this board of director idea. How do you boot someone off the board or how do you get someone onto your board that you're interested in? So I don't know that I've ever booted anyone off of my board. I sort of have been collecting people over the years and have pretty solid relationships with most of them. But sometimes there are people that come into your life for a season. And so I think that even on your board of directors of your career, that there may be somebody who comes in for a particular reason. And so therefore, it's always changing. Your board doesn't necessarily need to be static. You can have people who you need career advice when you're in this position. So you're a junior associate, right? But say you go in-house, then you need a different type of mentor. But that doesn't mean that you have to get rid of your old one, but you may need to add some new ones. And so that's why it's sort of an evergreen, always changing. And then this way it doesn't get stale. I presume that you've found yourself on other people's boards now, given the leadership part that you're playing in your firm. How do you take part in nurturing diverse talent that comes into Fagri Drinker? So what I do is to just be available to people because the junior associates, sometimes they don't know what they need. And so it's just helpful to be talking, to talk through your career. Like I enjoy telling people about the sort of the arc of my career because it's not straight. (laughs) It's all over the place. I've been in the government. I've been in house. I've been at a law firm. So I have a different perspective than maybe somebody who went to the same law firm and grew up from a summer associate to partner or somebody else who lateraled over or someone who's only been in the government. So I have a perspective that I am willing to share with any of the junior associates. And I also tend to mentor associates who may not be with my firm, in particular, associates of color who may be looking outside of their firm for some kind of mentorship and guidance. And so I'm happy to provide that. One doesn't have to be at my firm and you never know where folks will end up. For instance, one of my mentees has gone in-house And they're now my client. And so it's just, it's a different kind of relationship, but it is, I feel that I've been able to provide her various career advice along the way. And even now she's in-house, I've been in-house, so I can also provide her some support in that way as well. Wonderful. And you mentioned the arc of your career, which involves a lot of (laughs) twists and turns. Can you walk us through that a little bit and share how some of those pivotal points happened and I think a lot of people have whatever ideas they have as they enter law school and consider being a lawyer. And I think for a lot of people, myself included, it doesn't always look like what you may have expected. Opportunities come. But tell us a bit about what that arc looked like for you and how some of those pivotal moments occurred. So I started off with the traditional summer associate position at Rifkin Radler and then got an offer to come in as an associate. And I just, I really loved Rifkin, all the people who were there. I was doing all kinds of 
litigation. I was doing receivership work, hazardous waste insurance coverage, I was doing some bankruptcy. Like anytime anyone needed some help, I was raising my hand because I was just so thrilled with the opportunity to be at a law firm that I just wanted to do whatever I could. Through that, I decided that I wanted to be a trial lawyer. And so the cases that I was working on with Bill Savino were like these huge hazardous waste insurance coverage cases that were going on for years and years. And at the end of the day, for the most part, we'll probably never actually get to trial. And so I kind of saw that I would be like the 20th attorney taking the deposition because the cases were so huge. But then I also worked on the cases that Joe Ortego gave me and I was able to go to court on some smaller matters. And I really enjoyed being in court. And so I made the hard decision to leave the law firm because I just didn't see a path to the trial courtroom. And so I got an opportunity to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office, Eastern District of New York. So the U.S. Attorney had changed and it became Zachary Carter. He was hiring his first class of assistants. And so I decided that this is one of the things that I wanted to do. And so I was in the civil division. So we were defending a lot of the cases brought against the government, whether it was employment cases, tort cases, which involved federal employees who were involved in maybe car accidents, or there was slip and falls on government property and things like that, social security cases. I also did some asset forfeiture cases on sort of the affirmative side. While there is a lot of training at the U.S. Attorney's Office, there's also a lot of trial by fire where you just are dropped in and you're expected to be able to handle the cases. But all of that was just great. And it got me in the courtroom. And that was what I absolutely loved being in the courtroom and you develop relationships where the judges expect that you're always going to be truthful and forthright when they ask you questions and you know you're going to see them again and again. And so it's a very good thing to be able to stand up in court and say that I represent the United States of America. And so I probably would have stayed there for a very long time because I completely enjoyed it. But then I got married. I had two kids. I had the live-in babysitter. And we were very much squished up in our home in Queens. And I needed some more space. And we made the decision to move to New Jersey. And with that decision, I ended up having to leave the office because there was no way that I could do that commute from where I was in Jersey to Brooklyn. And so I went to a law firm in New Jersey. And, uh, and at that point, I was in counsel. So I was no longer like a junior associate. As I left Rifkin, I was now a counsel. And so that was a very different experience being at a firm and having had the kinds of trial experience that I had. So I was not totally happy there. And then an in-house position opened up at, at UBS. And so a colleague of mine from the U.S. Attorney's Office ended up at UBS and they had an opening and they were looking for an in-house litigator, which is an unusual kind of position, but it was perfect. And so I ended up interviewing and getting that job. And so I was handling all kinds of litigation in-house for, for the company. And it was good because I could actually handle some of the litigation. And if it got to be too much, we had outside counsel. So I was managing outside counsel as well. And so all of that was great. Another great career move. I'm very happy. I'm in-house. And then the financial crisis of 08 happens. And then UBS, one of the banks, and so they decided to change up their litigation model. And so they came up with this unique model where they decided to send the work to outside counsel, and they decided to send the excess litigators to that same outside counsel. And so the company benefited because they had all of my experience and the others who went with me had all of our experience. They didn't lose it because it got transferred to the firm and the firm had been one of our outside counsel anyway. And so it was sort of a win-win for everyone. But then I found myself back at a firm, <laughs> which was not what I had thought I would be doing. So, so all was good and I liked the firm a lot. And then I ended up making partner. So I ended up staying there for a little bit. And then I ended up getting recruited to Fagery Drinker, which at the time was Drinker Biddle. I got recruited to come in and work in a financial services litigation department. And so I took that position and that's where I am today. Shifting gears a little bit, you mentioned earlier the subject of availability for mentorship. And it struck me when you use that word 
that's really changed in the past few years because of the pandemic, because of the workplace, that's the workplace environment that's changed and how lawyers communicate. What does that kind of availability look like these days? How do people get your attention? How do you seek out mentoring other people or just communicating with your team? Do you find it harder, easier? What is your situation at your firm? Yeah, I think it's a little mixed, right? So during the pandemic, one of the things that we did for my group is that we would have weekly check-ins. So Wednesday at five, we would all jump on a WebEx. It wasn't mandatory. It was if you wanted to. And we found that people wanted to. And we included, in addition to the partners, we had the associates, but we also had the secretaries, the legal assistants, and the paralegals because they're part of the team too, right? And so they're in the same situation working at home and sort of being isolated as we all were. And so it was very nice for us to get together once a week to just talk about anything or nothing. We were not talking about work assignments, but in fact, like, how are you doing? We got to know each other's pets and all the other things that were going on with the, in the pandemic, who had a Peloton bike and things like that. And so it was really good to see other people. I mean, I was here with my family at home, but I know that some of our associates lived alone. The legal assistant lives alone. It's very hard. And so I think that us getting together like that provided a natural outlet for people. So then once we switched back to being in the office a little more often, I try to let the associates know when I'm going to be in the office and then hopefully they will be there too. But we try to coordinate because it's just nice to be able to see the people that you're working with and that you're not on a Zoom all the time or a WebEx and stuff. So I have some mentors at the firm who I'm advisor for. And so one of the things that we do is we put a weekly meeting on our calendar with the understanding that occasionally things may change, but we try to do it Monday mornings. And I take the time with them at that time to not talk about our work assignment. So we might have some things blowing up and a lot of stuff going on, but I specifically put aside that time to talk about their development as associates and to mentor them. And so occasionally something may have to get canceled, but we reschedule it. But I find that once you put that on the calendar, that it's months are not going to slip by. It might be a week, but whatever, that's fine. But you don't want a few months to go by and you haven't really had a discussion about your development. Like, where are you on the things that we talked about the last time? Like, I expect that we're going to move the needle a little bit. So if we were talking about revising your bio, like, where are we with that? Revising your LinkedIn, where are we with that? As with my involvement at the City Bar, I think Bar Association activity is important. And so I will have them look and see is there a bar association that has something that's of interest to you? And so where did, you know, where did that research lead you? Have you joined? Have you joined the committee? Are you doing things? So I try to help them along the way. And there is some accountability there. But by putting that meeting on the calendar, it's there and we are going to talk. <laughs> well, I think that's really interesting because I, first of all, because it's Monday morning and I can see that's an intense time to talk about personal development and professional development as opposed to work. But I think that speaks for itself about the importance of it. And also, frankly, because when you mentioned revising bios and revising your LinkedIn, I'm surprised, frankly, at how nitty gritty that is and how you're reaching into a very nitty gritty aspect of their development. Are there other concrete examples? I mean, I, I think most people might assume, oh, well, we're talking about business development. And you're going to these folks and saying, where are the new clients? How is the rainmaking going? And of course, other professional development things as well. But when you mentioned something so specific, that really mm -hmm. caught my attention. Those are things that really on your radar screen, do you work with your professional development staff? at the firm, because that is almost sounding like mm -hmm. concentric rings there? Or is this just because you're thinking, listen, you really got to have these things set. No one else is going to remind you about this. And also asking you a bunch of questions at once. <laughs> how do they react? Are they like, geez, Tracy, like I'm trying to work here, that, like revising my bio, can someone else do work on that for me? Or do they say, I really haven't thought of that and I really appreciate it? So yes, we get into the nitty gritty like that. But some of the other items, concrete things that I have them do is to figure out what types of events 
they want to go to? Like, where are the people that you feel that you want to meet? And I'm sure we're going to get into this with the business development that it's all about relationships. And so if you start early, it will just be a little more natural for you and it'll be a little easier for you. And so again, with the Bar Association, I tell them that you need to join a group, you need to figure out what you want to do. And so that's why I have them explore different opportunities. But I think going to events is very important. That has been one of the things that I have done over the years. And with the pandemic, it's obviously it had been a little harder, but I still encourage them to go to the Zoom events. You'll have fun. You'll meet some other people. My firm, my group, we would, during the pandemic, we did things like a little wine and cheese. And so some opportunities to have some interactions that were out side of work, even though we were on WebEx or Zoom. It's all about those relationships. So that goes back to your LinkedIn and to your your bio, because that is the world's introduction to you if people look you up. So if they Google you, these are the things that are going to come up. And these are the things that need to speak to who you are and what you're doing with your career. And so I don't think that it's enough to just say like you're an associate in the business litigation group and that's what you do. I mean, that doesn't really say much. And so you need to jazz it up a little more. There are times when I'm like, did you put that on your bio? Like we just had a victory in a matter like that should go on your bio. And some of the times they said, oh, I didn't even think about that. And it's like, that's important. You got to put that out there, but it needs to be up to date because it also is the thing that the partners here use when we're responding to pitches. We submit the bios of our prospective teams. And so you want those bios to speak to who the folks really are. I feel we're sort of coming, I don't want to jinx it, coming somewhat out of the pandemic. And so now is the time to continue developing and building relationships. Well, you're touching on a lot of the biz dev stuff that I wanted to ask you about, but One question was, how do people transition from becoming sort of more of a -a workaday lawyer to becoming a rainmaker at their firm? How do you change your mindset into that kind of relationship builder and to change your perspective as an attorney? And I think something else you've been touching on, let's assume there's some resistance. For some people, that might come quite naturally. They really might be more of a rainmaker than than a more technician as an attorney. So they might be waiting for that to happen. For those people that are resistant to it, Is it the pandemic? Are some people just more introverted? Are some people just thinking, well, that's not really what I signed up to do? How about the difference in hours? I mean, you know, how do you grow and build that attorney as they progress in the law firm? Or are some people that's just not what their bailiwick is? And you have to sort of accept that and the firm has to figure out how that fits into their bigger picture. or How does that work? Yeah, so I would say you kind of phrase it as a change, right, from being the workaday lawyer and the rainmaker. So I would say you have to have the mindset from the beginning about developing relationships. And relationships are important to your career. Because one, you never know where people, other people are going to be, and you never know where you're going to be, right? And so it's important to always have the, the relationship. So if you start from the beginning of developing your relationships with the folks that you're working with, keeping in touch with the folks you went to law school with, maybe you went to college with, and then you can become a rainmaker from that as you progress in your career. And a lot of times it is a mindset, and they do think that they cannot do it because they think there's some magic to it, but there's no magic to it. When you're in-house, you have to have relationships, but they may not be for the same reasons because in-house, you may want to move up the ladder. You you might want to move to the business side. And so while you don't need to be a rainmaker in-house or with the government, there's still the relationship value that helps you and with your career. So I think you had mentioned something about the folks who are introverts, right? So I am definitely an introvert. I'm talking to you now, but I've always been one who's been a little more on, I'm probably mixed, but a little more on the introvert side. But a long time ago, I decided that I needed to be able to get out there and to speak on panels. I was terrified. Speak on panels, talk to different people, networking, like, oh my gosh, like that was just like, oh, you mean go into a crowded crowded room and like talk to people that I don't know? Like that was all very discombobulating, but I knew I had to do it and I kind of had to force myself to do it. And so I would do it. One of the things I tell the associates that when they go to an event, 
if you go to the event early, you are coming into a room that's not full. Like there's a big difference when you walk up and you're entering an event and the room is full and it's like this sea of people and you're like, where do I go? Who do I talk to? What's going on? If you get there early and you plant yourself at a table where you can kind of see people coming in and out, you might catch the eye of somebody. You might see somebody that you can make some small talk with people who are there early. And it's just much easier than trying to do that, plunge into this crowded room. And I'm one because I don't live close to the city where I tend not to stay to the end of an event. But I'm like, it doesn't matter because I've met all the people and talked to everybody I wanted to because I went early, right? So if you have to leave because you have a train to catch, you need to get home, that's fine. You've done what you needed to do with that event by getting there early and talking to people and making chit chat and things like that. And then you also have to follow up. That's the other important thing about the relationships and the business development is following up. And what does the follow-up look like? I mean, how hardcore are we talking about here? It's whatever makes you comfortable, whether it's connecting with someone on LinkedIn and sending them a note. If you got a business card, which we used to do back in the day, at this point, I think we're all exchanging LinkedIn QR codes, but that makes it even easier to just send someone a note. And it's like, hey, enjoyed meeting you last night. We talked about blah, 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 whatever. And just to keep it to keep it going, right? Because then later on, maybe your firm is doing an event where you can invite people, you can invite this person. Or if you're in, on a bar association committee and you're having an event, you might want to invite this person. So you have to think and be strategic about your relationship. So think about how can I help this person? So I can help them by inviting them to an event that they might enjoy by inviting them to a program that is helpful to their career. And so by thinking that way, I think you are, you know, helping your own side of the relationship, but then you're also giving to the other person. And so that's where the relationship will develop. How can I help this person as opposed to how can they help me? I think that's got to be topsy-turvy for a lot of lawyers to hear. Exactly. Exactly. All right. I'm going to have to think about that one. Let me ask you about feedback. The managing up, managing down. How do you like to get feedback from others? Getting feedback from people that I would say I'd like to hear it directly. I'd like to hear it closer to the event in time. One of the things I say to the associates that I mentor you should not be surprised at anything you hear in your review, right? So if we do reviews once a year or twice a year, you should not be surprised because the person that you are working for, you should get that feedback as close to the event as possible. Now, I know we're all busy and sometimes it's hard to do that right away, but I think that the associates who are a little more persistent with that, it will serve them well. So if you're doing a brief and even the partner doesn't get a chance to talk to you about whatever major rewrite they may have done, then take, take the brief that you wrote your draft and compare it to the final draft and then ask questions as to why, you know, if you can't figure it out just by reading through, ask the partner, ask the senior associate, well, why did you decide to use this approach or why did you do this? Or why did you leave that out? Because it's all a learning experience. And so I think it's important to hear it closer in time. That's what I would like to hear from the folks that I worked with and for the assignments that I would hand in. Has the work-life balance and expectations around that changed in your career arc and changed across the pandemic? I would say so. So in the beginning of my career, it there was no work-life balance. It just was not really that much of a thing. We would, if you had a family, you would get whatever your maternity leave is and come back to the firm, hope that all was well. I was fortunate. I had my kids when I was in the government. And so I was able to take my time and we would joke around because I came back and my desk was exactly the way that I left it because people don't have time to be picking up extra cases. But I will say that the judges were very understanding. And so you're pregnant. Okay, so we're going to kick these deadlines out so that you don't have to have one of your colleagues who doesn't know what's going on in your case handle something. It will wait until you get back. And so I think that that was a good thing. At the law firms, I think it was a little harder, but people did what they had to do. I think now with the pandemic, we've all learned that it's not necessary to work all day, every day, which is good. And to be home, that's good. So without naming names, 
what makes a client or one of your clients sort of the worst client and what makes one of your clients the best client? So I would say the worst clients are the folks who just have unreasonable demands. And so therefore the best of the clients are people that have reasonable demands and understand that their case is not the only one that you're working on. And similarly, without naming names, what made your worst boss the worst and your best boss the best? Okay, so my worst boss was someone who was just very condescending and someone who did not value my opinion as a, a joint owner of the case of the issue it was somebody who wanted to just dictate and tell me what to do instead of it being sort of a collaboration between the two of us. So therefore, the best partners that I have worked with are people who tend to be collaborative and who want to hear your opinion and who want your input, right? Because it is, I think, the client overall is served better when lawyers are collaborative. What is one thing you would say to a brand new lawyer or one small piece of advice? Okay, so to a brand new lawyer, I would say just be willing to do anything and everything. I think it's important because you will learn what you like and what you don't like. And so if you only do what you think you like, that's not going to be very helpful because many of us thought the law was one way. And then when we got in, we realized that it was not. But this way, it keeps open your possibilities. Tracy Simon Smith, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for being our guest on This Lawyer's Life. Well, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to This Lawyer's Life. We are already planning more conversations with successful lawyers, and we want your help. If you have burning questions about professional development, share them with us by sending an email to thislawyerslife at nycbar.org. And don't forget to subscribe to This Lawyer's Life wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening to This Lawyer's Life. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the City Bar. Find more City Bar podcasts on Apple, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher or at our website at www.nycbar.org slash podcasts. And be sure to check out Building Belonging, a podcast that embraces authentic conversations about DEIB solutions by amplifying the most marginalized voices in the legal industry and exploring spaces others dare not. This podcast was produced and edited by Eli Cohen.